an airline pilot for Delta for 26 years, a pilot's primary flight instrument is his artificial horizon, which he has to be maintained level to keep from climbing and descending. From a cockpit, weather permitting, I can see hundreds of miles in all directions, viewing cities connected by roads across the flat plain as far as the eye could see. So everybody, say hi to Joe. Um, the reason his face is blurred out is because he is currently um, a pilot and this would be a conflict of interest? Correct, yeah. We're all, uh, all of our companies make us sign an agreement where we're not allowed to speak to any media and any questions. Um, actually, any pilot has uh, presented to them in the United States by any media organization needs to be directed to our company spokesperson and or uh, union representatives. Um, basically, they don't want any of us talking to uh, any media. Um, seems that, that that's a pretty good wall of defense to keep um, anything that you might be seeing out there in the air. Um, what, what, what an airline pilot thinks of what this earth looks like. So you've been looking into the flat earth concept for how long? I've been looking into it just for the past couple years. Um, it all started off with, it all started off with looking at uh, some pictures that NASA had presented in the past and I saw some pictures of the original moon landing that I had some questions about. And then a few years ago they were supposed to release all of these pictures that had never been seen before and, uh, and it was supposed to prove a lot of naysayers wrong and then all of a sudden those pictures mysteriously disappeared. And uh, whenever you see companies like that, NASA doing something, um, it raises a lot of questions. So the more research I did, the more questions I had, the more questions I had, the lack of answers. So I started to do my own research and I really had more questions than I had answers. What, what is it that drives you to, to want to, to know more? It seems like so many people are just content with not knowing. Well, I think that's exactly it, is the more you learn, the scarier it is, because if it is true, and the evidence has led me to believe so, um, I, I just flew back from Dubai, and I was in Bali, Indonesia before that, and, and if, if it is true, then it, it means we're, we're all on a farm, and we're being lied to, and it's like you're, you're a sheep on the farm, maybe not for the slaughter, but then, you know, other sheep come to, to warn you, hey, you're on this farm, and, and you may want to escape people, may, maybe like Jesus and, and, and Buddha and many others before them that have been persecuted, and if it's true, we need to find out, and 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 listen to these people uh, like Adam that I first got into Flat Earth like two years ago and probably about the same time you you first heard of it and I always wondered like you know is there I don't fly air rumors that looking out the cockpit window is not the same as looking out the side windows of the aircraft that are more kind of fish-eyed and correct double double layered so that it does kind of make a curve, curved horizon, but uh, I remember I asked you last time, is it true? Does it look flat from the front of the aircraft? It looks completely flat from the front of the aircraft. You're absolutely right. The uh, All the windows from the passenger's perspective are curved and you could read a lot of textbooks that, that state reasons why, but it's not the the curve that that the airplanes need. It's basically the, the triple pane and, and shape of the window. So that's one of many uh, anomalies that I've seen flying that I've just uh, been perplexed by over the years. 
One thing I've noticed, well, I've been on a couple flights, and the, probably the last one was in 2014. I flew all the way to New York and back. Spent a couple weeks there, but during the flight, it was always at night, so I never really got to see much of the land as we were crossing over to really see if there was curvature or not. But the thing I noticed is on the there's a little TV screen in front of each of the seats, and it, it would show you could watch TV or you know pay for some weird movie, but it would show you the airspeed and the temperature of the air. Correct. And I noticed it's really cold up higher the higher you go. Absolutely. And I'm curious when you're flying in the daytime and say, I mean, do flights ever fly directly under the sun? Have you ever flown like under the sun? Yeah, I, I've never thought about that, but uh, no, I've never... Come near it? No, I, I've never flown directly under the sun, at least not that. Is it possible that the flight coordinators are aware that if you fly too close to the sun, you're gonna burn up, or it's, or is it hotter okay. near the sun? It's something that I've actually never thought about, but uh, it's funny that you mention that because I've literally never thought of it. But yeah, the sun has never been directly overhead of the uh, of the aircraft. One thing that I've thought about, though, is when, well, let's say you're flying, the average commercial aircraft flies at about 38,000 feet, which up there the temperature is about negative 50, maybe negative 60 degrees really Celsius. At, at that temperature, it's about the same as Fahrenheit. And one of the examples that they use where you can't fly over in Antarctica, it's on a little bit different topic, do you mind if I yeah. just briefly say yeah. this? Move temperatures are so extreme and but the temperatures are so extreme at every altitude that we we fly at and we're always flying around thunderstorms and supercells and and once I heard that the, the argument of these extreme temperatures you can't get more extreme temperatures literally than what we fly and and, and ice can't freeze uh, I'm sorry ice past negative 30 it can't gather on the aircraft so once you're flying at that altitude of, in, in, in those extreme temperatures, you're not worried about any ice accumulation, any ice ingestion in the engine. So the argument that you can't fly over Antarctica due to the extreme weather conditions is, is just a complete, complete lie. Um, like I said, I've never thought about the, the, the sun thing, but I've thought about the, uh, la the zero flights over Antarctica. And um, that's led me to more, more questions. But I'll definitely have to look more into the sun. I, I've never seen overhead. Um, I, I know a lot of flat earthers know about the ex how the moon and the sun ap appear to be the exact same size from our visual perspective. I've seen moon moon rises that look like sunrise rise when the sun was supposed to be on the other side. I've seen so many anomalies in the course of the that, uh, that's led me to where I was. That's when I ran into Adam and, and he was just such a wealth of knowledge of words and etymology of words and, uh, and really an amazing figure. That's why I've agreed to do this interview. Although, Thanks, buddy. Um, it's probably definitely put my career at risk. One thing that I have noticed flying that has completely blown my mind is the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and there's been plenty of times where the sun, we've been flying eastbound. Late at night, we do a lot of red-eye flying where you leave at you know 10 o'clock at night and then land at six in the morning. But where the sun is set and you would actually, where it's just set on the other, you know, set on the west, and then you see a little glimpse hours later on the east where I, I'd ask the other pilot, I'd say, you know, is, that the, is that the sun rising? You know, is, there, is that a moon rise? And then it would dip back below. 
but I've seen where my mind was just blown because it didn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and then we take our little Apple or Android star map out to find where the moon was and it wasn't there. But basically, it looked like the sun was about to rise in front of us in the east when it had just set behind us in the west hours prior. And then of course, you know, six hours later it would rise in the east. But basically I've seen just positions of the sun where it shouldn't, shouldn't be um, from that altitude. Going back to your previous question at that point, you know, it was definitely below us. And it never fully rose, but I mean, without any question, it wasn't a star or the moon. It was a sun rising on the other side of the earth when wow. it was supposed to be in the west. So I've seen plenty of things like that. Like I said, where I've queried the other guy or gal that I've been flying with. And we were just, you kind of both shrug it off and say, well, maybe it was a star or something, but just these impossibilities that until you query me with these questions that you kind of forget about and then just keep on flying. And that seems to happen a lot where you bring up something that is mind blowing and then you just kind of, well, you pass it off as almost as someone saw a ghost or something. Well, you, know, you forget yeah. about it and keep on. That doesn't fit in our paradigm. So. Um, I don't know if that's exactly. Yeah, no, what that's you're great. I, I think so. You see the the light coming from the east when it should be on the other side. I've seen that um, a, a dozen times. You never see it like you can't see the light from the north or. Because um, if it is a flat Earth, like if 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 it's a circle, like the I think the model a lot of us have gotten used to. You would expect that at some some height, and if the at some height, you would see it, you know, to the north, directly sure. across. But you're saying it kind of wraps around sooner when you're up high, maybe the light from it. What I'm saying is, when it was setting in the west, and we were flying east, that you know, a few hours later, you know our view is about 180 degrees. Sure, often it would be a little, a little more northeast. north, northeast, not directly in front of us, but then it would, it would stay dipped below the horizon when it was, it would, it would rise and set when it was supposed to be behind us. And I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're asking, but uh, one of the anomalies I've definitely seen is, is the sun in, in the position that it was not supposed to be in a round earth model. Multiple times. Sure. Sure. One question that just came to me. Um, flying, if it's a flat circle Earth and that the lines of latitude are circles, and then if you were to just fly straight, then you would always end up going south. In that, you know, theoretically. So, Here's my question. When you're following your coordinate system or keeping track of where you're at, which I don't know how, how well you even do that or need to, but um, do you feel like when you're going west, do you have to continue to turn left in order to stay straight? Or do you just go straight and that's west? We keep going straight and that's west. It's, it's as if there's something else going on other than just what we even think we're evolving to understand. Well, so what's your take on that? How, that, is that just a, a mind blow? It, it really isn't, it's something that I've, I've never thought about, but uh, you're absolutely right in that regard, as if you're following, you know, the, the curved earth, you wouldn't be pointing, wet, you know, due west and uh, ending up in a, you know, another location, like you said, you'd be doing multiple turns. Something else that I've, I've thought about along those lines is oftentimes as well, you talked, you mentioned, um, you've mentioned, you know, how exactly do you do that? We do it through multiple systems in the aircraft. We have these, these, 
you have GPS and, and these internal navigation systems, um, VOR systems, NDB systems. We have so many navigational systems, but oftentimes you'll be flying along. Very oftentimes you'll be flying along, and all those will go haywire, and so then you'll just be getting coordinates from you know our, our government air traffic control on on exactly how to fly, and then they basically say that they're you know jamming the, the radar they're practicing it for war games or something like that but um, it seems like oftentimes when you should be doing something like that uh, especially when you're flying west across the United States you'll reach a certain point where your systems will uh, be altered and then you'll be given coordinates to fly. Um, so I don't know if that uh, if that was along the, the yeah. same lines with what you were. Anything else you want to put out there? The things you've seen that maybe other questions you have from from your experience? How many how many hours of experience do you have in the air? Um, I. I've been commercially flying for the last 12 years. I've worked for uh, three major airlines in the United States that I'm sure uh, everybody's heard of. Um, I've met pilots in the military, um, pilots in New Zealand, and especially when you talk to pilots in New Zealand, that's where you get the most, you get the most questions that they don't even have answers to because some of your shortest routes should be over Antarctica and they're not and they have questions and as I was telling Adam uh, one time before is a lot of times you present these questions and they just don't want to talk about it or you, you raise something and and it just it, it, they get uncomfortable. It would be like asking somebody a, a question about what, what some theory on, on another nature. Or a, a, you ask a pilot about something abnormal, about 9-11 or something. As soon as you bring it up, they kind of get uncomfortable and maybe they start thinking about their career or job and they don't want to be grouped into that category. So a lot of times you meet people that have questions I think all of us have, as aviators have questions. We see things that don't make sense. Um, so many pilots have seen strange things that, that I don't even want to go off on another tangent. But like I said, as so many of them are concerned about their financial careers, their family, their medical. You mention something and you're crazy, you lose your medical license and your career is over. And there's so much fear out there that we're really not allowed to talk about any of this. And it's it's horrible, and it's not just pilots. It's it's astronauts. Um, it's everyone. When you sign these waivers, that you're not allowed to talk about any of this because the fact of the matter is, is they don't want you to know that essentially we're all on this farm here, and what are we doing on it is the is the ultimate question. So, and that's what I got out of Adam is I I, I hope. Love is the, the escape. Um, I'm not talking about going out there and doing anything crazy, but but going within. I've talked to another pilot who was open to this. He talked about uh, you know tapping the source, God, spirituality. Something is is if this is all artificial, find the reality, tap into that, get that information, and. and leave the farm. That's, that's yeah. what I've got. Yeah, rise so. above it. Good stuff. Well, uh, I'm not sure what else we can cover. You mentioned 9-11, and I've heard from a lot of pilots that uh, that maneuver of aircraft is uh, something to be pretty impressed with um, as far as being able to maneuver a plane to make those types of turns and and just nail the building so dead on center. Yeah. 
Every pilot knows it. Even if they don't know it, if you ask them the, the physics, if you ask them the air speeds, they'll say, oh, an air, it's called your maximum operating airspeed. They do tests on every aircraft that at a certain speed, an aircraft will literally just disintegrate in the air, that it's not structurally able to take that. It's happened um, with the it was Japan Airlines. It hit some extreme turbulence many years ago, and the aircraft reached an airspeed not even close to what the aircraft on 9-11 reached. And, and they, they break up, stuff starts falling off, and they reach these, air, these impossible airspeeds. And, and everybody knows it. Um, I could go go on, on and on about mock tuck, mock buffet. Once you're at that altitude, even at, at that low altitude, at that high airspeed, even the slightest pitch or bank, you're gonna you're gonna go into a mock tuck. You're gonna the aircraft's gonna gonna stall. Uh, the the engines are gonna compress or stall. It, it's an impossibility that once again. Um, Everybody knows, but nobody wants to talk about. And you hate it because then all of a sudden you hear people say, oh, well, he's one of those truthers. Or, but in reality, it's a joke. It really is. It's, it's, everybody knows it, but no one wants to talk about it. it was, it'd be like if you had a neighbor that everyone knew was, Doing something wrong, or back in the day, the the president that had a slave that he was sleeping with, that everyone knew about, but nobody wanted to talk about it. And that's one of the sad realities of of the system that we're living in. Is it's all fear based. You talk about it, you're going to be labeled as crazy, a conspiracy theorist. You know, you're going to lose your job, and and that's that's the sad reality. And it it's all linked. Um, yeah. Like I said, I think the same people behind that are the same people that that are pulling the wool over your eyes. So. Yeah, it seems that they work very, very hard to uh, deceive us, and they 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 teach us from day one. They put this thing in our face, right? Right when we're old enough to not even read, they say, "Oh, this is where you live," and. Uh, you can question it, you can, you know, wrap your head around it, you can see it all, but on the bottom, it almost always says, not for educational purposes. I don't see it on this one, though. Oh, it's probably on there somewhere, I've never looked, but... It's usually on the base, but this one doesn't have that. I saw that in Daphne Rimmel's video the other day. It doesn't feel like that the truth of Flat Earth is going back in the box. What they want us to believe is that we're so insignificant that we're just this tiny little earth floating in this vast universe that you're, you don't mean anything, your life doesn't mean anything, and that's part of enslaving, enslaving somebody. If, if anyone else were to do that, if you were to, to kidnap a child and, and do that, and you know, you're meaningless, you're worthless, and that person would be locked up for you know, verbal abuse or or torture later on, but they, they're trying to, to teach this religion of, of that you have no meaning, you have no purpose, that your purpose is just to make money and to, to work and to consume and to go in this vicious cycle while they, um, you know, blame Muslims for wars that the United States has has created Libya. I've, I've been there. It was just fine before we overthrew Gaddafi. Syria was just fine before we intervened. Iraq was just fine. Sure, we had they had some cruel leaders, but we've had some the same. But they're creating this chaos in the world. We're worshiping these celebrities. Like I talked to him. If, uh, I was listening to a Katy Perry song on the radio that talked about how we're all living in a bubble. There's these messages all around us where they try to make us seem so insignificant, but we're so much more than that. And that's the journey that I'm on is to, is to find it. I think Jesus found it. I think Buddha found it. I think many other people have found it. And I think that that's really what 
what we need to to learn and find is that, that you're more than that. There's so much more out there. And is the answer literally on the other side of Antarctica, past that ice wall? Once you get out there, is it like a literally a sheep that escaped from the farm and now all of a sudden you're in the, the way you're supposed to be? Is it literally? Is it metaphorically? Is it spiritually? That is the ultimate answer. But the biggest thing that I've learned is that it's one of those and that this isn't it. We're, we're not just, just some nobodies here. We are everything. This couch is, is here because we, we see it, we are it. Light shines on it, but we, we perceive it. And that's what we are. We are, we are everything. We are all knowing, all, all powerful. And you know, I could go on and on. Yeah, <laughs> but, man. But that's, that's the most important thing that I've learned. And uh, me too. Well, it's been a great interview. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate your time. So I know you're a busy man. You probably got to get back on the plane. Absolutely. This really is a wonderful man. The first time I ever met him, he, he really was a Christ like figure in terms of his love for, for people and, and truth and there's not a bad bone in his body. When, when I met him, I have to say that, that his message to you all is important. He knows way more than he, he's probably showing on, on this channel because sometimes these interviews are difficult, but, but please continue to listen in, to listen to his messages because like he just said, the truth's out there and the truth is the only thing that's going to set you free. And we have to learn from each other and learn from people like this that I believe have a gift that need to be shared with you all. So please like, subscribe, share with your friends and, and get this message out there of not just flat earth, but love and, and that we're all being duped and, and the real answer's out there. And, and He's closer to it than I am. I'm, I'm just a person flying out there that sees a bunch of stuff that doesn't make any sense and knows for a fact that we are being lied to. So that's all I have to say. So it's been a pleasure and, and thanks for having me on your channel. And uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope it doesn't uh, mess with my career, but I guess if it does, then you'll, it'll even prove it further that it all is one big lie. So. Thanks, yeah. thanks for your time, and, and it's been a no fear. great experience. Yes, sir. Awesome.